Tommy Salo. That is a name that is going to come up in this episode, and with good reason, and a name that will resurface in this episode as a second fiddle guy. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, a shootout in a very famous Olympic uh, game in just a little bit. This is uh, In Goal Magazine, In Goal Radio, the podcast, Darren Millard, along with the co-founders, Kevin Woodley and David Hutchison, presented by The Hockey Shop, the hockey shop source for sports, uh, source for sports in Surrey. Uh, we're going to go down memory lane with one of the more interesting personalities uh, of goaltending. Manny Legacy will stop by, a former National Hockey League netminder and also now a goaltending coach in the National Hockey League with the Columbus Blue Jackets. And in the gear segment today, we're going to keep your socks dry with Zenkai. That, I just stole that from, from Dave Hutchison. Uh, Woodley, Hutch, how are you guys? Uh, Hutch, uh, nice job on the, uh, on the rhyming with the, with the uh, gear segment. Well, I like to get a little punny whenever I can. Not I'm very just bright, very but the solid. odd one comes up. I'm just impressed that either one of you guys could say it. I certainly didn't say it properly during the interviews about this, the material. Yeah, but you have to do it live. We've got no pressure. We can just rehearse here. It's a it's a double interview on the gear segment today. Well, you know, uh, Cam knew his stuff. He knew that it worked when we talked to him at the hockey shop, but we didn't really understand. Frankly, neither of us really understood the science behind it. Uh, after being told for years and years that wicking moisture off the body was good, this is a this is a bit of a different take on it, and the science backs it up. So we brought in the founder. Uh, Doug Lynch, or one of the co-founders, Doug Lynch, to to really explain to us why. It's a fascinating listen. I highly recommend that everybody sticks around uh, till the end of the interview uh, or to the end of this podcast to to listen to to these guys talk about this product. At the end of the day, guys, like like we discover products every once in a while that sort of, you know, it's things you didn't think of. Uh, and these undergarments, these socks, to me, these are one of those things where you wouldn't normally think of this being a big deal. And yet, I can tell you in my locker room uh, for one of my weekly skates, which is loaded with guys who played at a high level, everybody in the room now has a pair from one or two guys raving about them. They're fantastic. So this is also why we go to the hockey shop. It's not just about the latest in gear. It's not just about the, you know, the newest pads and gloves and masks and chesty. They also are ahead of the curve when it comes to finding new products. And so no surprise that they'd be ahead of the curve when it comes to finding the Zenkai, especially the socks, but also all the other undergarments that they sell. So make sure you keep an eye on our website and their social media channels uh, for links to that product. Also, make sure you keep an eye on thehockeyshop.com for the upcoming sale. We're only two days away as we record this, March 13th to 29th. It's the end of season sale. All the new gear's coming in April and May. That means you can buy the old gear at a discount. All Bauer Supreme Goal is 25 or sorry, 20% off. Almost chucked in an extra 5% there. Sorry, Cam. Uh, all CCM Premier too, uh, 20% off. And this includes like chest and arm, pants, all through the levels, all the CCM Premier line, all the Supreme Goal from Bauer, Warrior G4, Vaughn V8, everything. 20% off March 13th to 29th. If you can get there in person, Hockey Shop Sorcerer Sports in Surrey, online at thehockeyshop.com. And keep an eye on their social too. More information will be coming out every week about Tendi Fest 5, May 24th. Mark the date on your calendar, 11 to 4 at Burnaby 8 Rings. And keep your eyes on their social media channels for the latest announcements about guests and prizing and all the gear that you're going to be able to test in person on the ice. A lot in there, but uh, Zenkai is the uh, product that we will talk about today. It keeps you dry, but also is, uh, is a proactive uh, product when it comes to little things like skate bite and and, and is really innovative product. So make sure you stick around uh, for that on our gear segment brought to you by The Hockey Shop, The Hockey Shop Source for Sports, the source for sports in Surrey. Uh, our, our feature interview today is uh, Manny Legacy. And there is a, there's a lot in here and uh, good on you for catching up with Manny and uh, for, for being able to really pull the personality out, uh, out of him because he's a, he's a soft-spoken, quiet, uh, terrible storyteller. Uh, has has really no personality to him, and uh, and you really really did a good job of uh, of being able to dive in there. Well, for, f first off, good on Hutch for being able to pull the audio out because it wasn't the best circumstances. Uh, as everything changes around this virus and what rooms we can and can't use at Rogers Arena, I ended up having to do it in a media room, and about halfway through, uh, one of one of the local radio personalities had to do a live hit on TSN 1040 here in Vancouver, and. Jeff Patterson, my buddy, has he has a radio voice and it was booming in the background. So Hutch did a nice job of of sort of 
eliminating that and focusing on Manny and also good on Manny for sticking around. We got to telling stories and we sort of lost track of time. Uh, but this interview was conducted, conducted pregame. And by the time we looked at our watches, he was basically rushing out to watch the warm-ups really? before the game. And he, I totally cost him his pregame meal. 100% did not get to eat before the game that night because of us. So we owe Manny a big one. So where, where did you first come across Manny Legacy? And then we'll get into the interview. But I'm just curious uh, from, uh, from your perspectives. Oh, uh, playing days for me when he was with Detroit and when I was starting uh, Goalie News Magazine for me. So those would have been the first experiences. And obvious, and we talk about this, I, I, I had to bring it up as we've seen equipment change and evolve. A lot of people forget 04, 05, and I talked to him about this at the time. Marty Berdur basically made him the poster boy and the whipping boy during the 0405 lockout. And Manny talked about it, went to a union meeting and a PA meeting and basically got called out in front of everyone for cheating. Now, he wasn't, yeah. but he was five foot nine and he wore the max height pads of 38 inches and they looked big. It was within the rules completely, but he Using ended, the rules to his uh, utmost advantage. Yeah. And he ended up becoming the poster boy somewhat unfairly. But uh, so we talked about that in the interview too. And he's, he's got a good story. As usual, there's a good story. For me, it was the World Junior Championship when he was uh, so spectacular and, uh, and followed it up where he burst in the scene. And that, uh, that landed him the Olympic uh, assignment where he was supposed to be the, the shootout goalie in the gold medal game, but, uh, but got hurt. And, and that's where Tommy Sallow comes into this in a roundabout way. Hutch, you're looking at me funny, but nobody remembers who the other goalie was in that shootout. Everybody talks about Corey Hirsch and Peter Forsberg. Fair enough. But it was, it was, it was Tommy Sallow that, uh, that was the winning goaltender that made a, a two-pad stack uh, to win that gold medal. I didn't know that he made a two-pad stack to win that gold medal. I got to go look that up. I, just, I, was, I didn't know the story that Manny was the designated uh, shootout goaltender, and I just thought that was fascinating. I really wish it could have happened. Yeah, so yeah, does Corey I, Hirsch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right about that. And uh, you know what? Uh, it was it was really nice of uh, Manny to to go out of his way to say Corey gave them a shot to, in that shootout, and and it uh, it could have gone the other way. But I I don't know whether I'm Manny and I want to be thrown into that situation or not. Uh, we talk about it just for regular season games and being able to uh, to go in there cold. Never mind an Olympic uh, gold medal game. But uh, this is a this is a fun interview. There's a lot to talk about from uh, from the minor leagues to being. Uh, Signed as a free agent uh, to a Hall of Fame roster in Detroit, and then being part of the uh, the turn in gear when the National Hockey League started cracking down on goaltending equipment. It's Manny Legacy, uh, a great storyteller, and he uh, is on top of his game on Ingle Radio, the podcast, our source for sports, the Hockey Shop, thehockeyshop.com feature interview this week with Kevin Woodley. Right off the bat with Manny Legacy as we as we sit down to chat ahead of a Columbus Blue Jackets Vancouver Canucks game, I pull up the hockey DB and look at that handsome fellow. Oh yeah, look at that face. <laughs> so what uh, what what year are we looking at here? That was two thousand nine, two thousand ten. I was with the Chicago Wolves for a month there. That's where that picture's from. It's a beauty. I like yeah. the turtleneck. And then I went to uh, uh, Carolina right after that. Let's go back. Where it's where did it start? I, this I love to start this with every guy, and it it's almost become a cliche for our interviews. But where did the passion for the position start for you? A lot of we had a lot um, of older brother stories. What about yourself? No, I was the oldest brother, so uh, played in net. I mean, played out in net for my dad and my you know my mom and my dad were you know which got me to play this great game and introduced me to everything about it and you know tortured driving me to practice at six in the morning and tortured <laughs> my mom uh never missed even a junior game uh when i went to the ohl in niagara falls she uh she might have missed a handful i'm talking going to the sioux and thunder bay and by that time they lived in barry just south of barry in allison ontario and she went to almost every game and it was insane you know the the support that i got you know i, I was very very lucky as a as a child to get the support to play this game when did you start? What, like, what, at what age did goaltending? Um, um, nowadays, we see them so, so young. Were you were you position specific no, that early? My dad would not let me play goal, uh, but we'd rotate our goalie. And uh, my first couple years, then I kind of liked it. But then uh, one weekend, uh, we played for Corpus Christi, and uh, our goalie was sick, so I had to play. That's why I played and. 
you know, we were playing against the last place team. So my dad let us, let me play there. And, uh, you know, we were, I think we were like middle of the pack. So I really enjoyed it. And then, uh, the next year he wouldn't let me play a net for his team. <laughs> he was the I, coach. Yeah. Cause I was leading the team in scoring. So he's like, there's no way you're playing in net. So he signed me up for another team, which you're not allowed under a different name. And I played net for another house league team in, uh, East York and I was in at Corpus Christi it was a Catholic league for him and uh, the next year I played up as a goalie still played net for or played out for him next year I played uh, for the East York Bulldogs double A up though uh, and uh, Neil Osborne who taught me how to play the position uh, he was no goaltender and a firefighter and you know he was like the mentor for goalies for me uh, my dad was the mentor for playing out <laughs> and he was the mentor for goalies. And the next year, uh, I went and played for the Don Mills Fires. Uh, well, it was a funny story because the uh, Don Mills Fires head coach saw me play for my dad's team and asked me to come try out. And my dad said, yeah, because I was I think I was second or third in the league in scoring. And two weeks, three weeks later, he got a call from the house and same coach. And asked if you know if i could come try out as a goalie but it was under a different name and my dad goes well i talked to you a couple weeks ago and he told him the story he goes what do you need and he goes well i need a goalie so that's how i became a goalie so <laughs> how, now how old were you when this is happening because i mean uh, nowadays you can't even do both past no, you, a certain you age. could you couldn't do post when i was there we just <laughs> we just bent the rules <laughs> that's how much my parents loved hockey and you know cared about their kids and drove around and you know, my brother was also playing hockey. He was three years younger. So, you know, he was playing for Corpus Christi too, but, you know, to drive there and then try and get to another practice to be a goalie at East York. And it was, uh, I'm sure it was a scheduling nightmare for them. And, you know, it was, uh, you know, I owe everything I'm, I have in my life to them. So, but, uh, yeah, we bent the rules a little bit and, uh, we were, I was very fortunate to have some great coaches in my life. Okay. Now, do you remember the pseudonym, what the other name was to this? What's that? What, what, I have no idea what the other name okay, was. I was going to wonder I, if that was a story where I've been no, in the NHL and registered know, under a secret name. I know was it was that the Manny, one? It was a different last name. I know that. So I didn't go by like John or something. The next. That would have been a little yes. confusing <laughs> at a young age, right? They used uh, a different last name, but uh, it might have been Sydney, which was my mom's maiden name. So I could see them doing that because, you know, we're not too uh, black ops in our family. <laughs> <laughs> no spy stuff going on. That's a great story. Um, obviously, that's when it became something that... that you did more often. Mm-hmm. You, you mentioned um, Coach Osborne. Who are some of the other influences? Because because back then, like Jim nowadays, Gray. you got goalie coaches at such a young age. It wouldn't have been the case yeah, back then. Uh, I can't remember Shane's last name. Uh, he was my goalie coach for the Don Mills Flyers. Uh, Jim Gray was our head coach. Who was my head coach for five years and uh, gave me every opportunity to play. And uh, you know, obviously, got me to AAA. So in Toronto, which is is extremely hard to do. And uh, I was very lucky to have a coach who believed in me. And then he brought Shane on, who was my goalie coach. Um, and then I had, had Neil, who also was my goalie coach too. So it was, wasn't was really a technical thing with with guys. It was more of talking and mental and understanding the game. And, you know, it was a different approach back then. You know, it was, it was all about situation stuff and, you know, what to do here, what to do, more game planning stuff than, than a lot of technical, you know, most of it was... Uh, stand up and skate saves back then. So I was going to say, <laughs> and, two, two pads and, and I was a butterfly guy and everyone was like, stand up more, stand up more. I'm like, but the puck's on the ice. So I don't want me to stand up. So it was a, it was a funny battle mentally, internally for myself and, and them. I'm sure they frustrated them going down so much. Well, at what age did that become okay? Like, did you have to have that battle even through oh, into the Ontario Hockey still, League? No, it, it changed by, time, by then. You got yeah, time you got there was okay? Yeah. Well, you had Eddie Balfour and Patrick Waugh and, and, and those guys in the late 80s and early 90s who everybody was going down, you know, the, the game had changed and equipment got better and facial equipment got better and the fear was gone. And, uh, the coaching staff and the, I don't think nobody really watches goalies back then. So it was like, stop the puck, you know, who cares what else you do, but there was a lot of fear to playing goalie back then. You know, you didn't have to wear a face mask and, and you know what, till the seventies or sixties, when was it? When was the first goalie mask? Oh, I should know this off the top yeah, of my head, should. but sixties, yeah. Sixties. So, and then the, the real goal equipment didn't really for upper body didn't really come out to the, the mid mid eighties when we're talking John Brown, 
you know, develop, got away from the wings and the chest protector and the felt, you know, and, right. you know, and, and guys started adding plastics and, and stuff like that. And uh, then the game and the fear went away. And then guys just started going down because everybody was shooting on the ice and couldn't raise it as much. And, you know, and then it's just developed and developed and developed. And right now there's really no fear in, in being a goalie. And that's why the numbers are down and, and why, you know, uh, you look at six, five games, seven, six games back in the eighties where now it's two to one and three to two. And cause the goalies are obviously now a lot bigger yeah. <laughs> and there's no fear. What was that? Walk me through your evolution, you know, from, like you said, being ahead of the curve a little bit as a butterfly guy, as you, as you get into the OHL and into the AHL and, and minor pro and right up to the NHL. Well, I, I was very lucky, I, um, you know, for where I grew up and, you know, I got to watch hockey pretty much every day, you know, and, and, and watching, you know, Patrick Watt was, was a huge idol and Sean Burke was a huge idol. And I still remember him playing in the Olympics in, I think, believe it was 88. And where he took Cannon, threw one on his back, and then he went to New Jersey after and got them into the playoffs. And I think they lost in the first round in game seven. But, uh, you know, and, and then Eddie Balfour comes along and, you know, Dominic Hasek flopped around like a fish. And, you know, it was, <laughs> it was you know, the game was changed. Now, were you a guy that studied them? Like, were you paying attention? Like, like yeah, well, what I was that guy that you? would sit there and, and watch the stand-up guys and, you know, go and, you know, Mike Bossy coming down the wall and fired it on the ice. And I'm like, they're standing up. I'm like, why aren't you guys going down? But I didn't realize the fear factor that they had. And, you know, the, the mentality of the shooter was waste one by their head and then throw the next one by their feet. And, you know, I, I didn't realize the whole thought process through that, just watching it as a kid. And my guys didn't shoot it that hard. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so, and I was lucky to grow up in a time where I only wore the chest protector and wings until. Second year, Adam, I got a, like a, I forget what it even was. It was probably a brown chest protector, yeah. which was the first time uh, it was all connected. And it was all, once I put that on, I was like, <laughs> didn't even feel anything, you know? So it was, uh, got away from the felt. It was really nice. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it was a game changer. Right? Yes. We've had a couple of those guys on that have played through that era. Sean Burke talking mm-hmm. about how, you know. The fear factor was yes, real. It was do, real. Do you talk to that about your, your you know, now as a, as a oh, goalie yeah, coach with the no blue idea. jackets? They have, well, the, the best is they get hit and one time in practice, oh, my finger's numb. I'm like, you guys have no idea. You know, you guys have 30 gloves in there. Go pick out another one. You know? <laughs> what's, the, what's the worst you ever got hit and ever had to try and play through? Uh, well, the, obviously ours, you know, we had the little paddings and you get missed uh, when they hit the collarbone. You know, that's when that whole arm goes numb and the whole, sh- you know, you can't feel your fingers for about a period and a half. And, you know, it, it wasn't game so much because, you know, the adrenaline's Dirty pumping. Shots maybe, yeah. But your adrenaline's pumping, you know. Right. You get hit there again, you get hit there six times. It was that day in practice where you get hit and then you get hit three more times there and you're like, this is just yeah, does not fun. And you got 100 shots fun. coming still, <laughs> yes. yeah. This is not fun. And, you know, that, those were the worst when you get hit in the collarbone or, you know, but... uh Everywhere else, or the, the top of the knee was, then the knee pads came out, you know, in full force, and then that fixed that, you know, and then the, you know, Jaguar came out with those things that flopped down and closed the, like the drawbridges, and that fixed all that, so. <laughs> well, you, and again, you were, you were kind of, you were a part of all that evolution, including a part of the change back to starting to shrinking it through the lockout. I remember, um... I remember talking to you during that time and it was time where we started having measurements and stuff like that. Where do you think we are now? And what was that like being, if I remember correctly, you ended up getting pointed to by Berdur at a meeting. Yes. Yeah, so oh yeah. He, he uh, I wasn't even supposed to, like, it just happened to be in Detroit at the airport. And I guess it was a central place for all these guys to fly into. And, you know, the PA asked me to bring my gear there just because I was there and they probably couldn't get a hold of Osgood who was probably out West here for the site where his cottage was. So, uh, or Dom or Cujo, you know, they, they weren't in town. I just happened to be in town. Right. You were with the Red yes. Wings at the time, obviously. And, uh, I was just, yeah, I'd like to go just sit there. And I was a backup goalie. Like I wasn't even, I was playing 25, maybe 30 games a year. And, you know, I'd uh, be interesting to sit there and see the different nets that they've come up with and all the goofy things that they were trying. And, uh, it was interesting to sit there and then Marty just went off on me, you know, <laughs> and I was just sitting there going, and then when I went back at him, understood that he could move in a 38 inch pad and trying to penalize me because I was five foot nothing and 
you know, I could move in a 38 inch and bed. You were, and you weren't, and you weren't, it was just, that was, that was the, the max rules. height and yes. you were within the rules. Back yes. then there was a max height, whether you were six, four or five, 10, yes. that was just the reality. Yes. And then uh, I agree that, you know, that when I pulled out my, my gear that day and Marty Berdur called me a cheater, I'm like, this isn't your gear. This is not going to yeah, I wore two chest protectors my whole career in the NHL and pro. Uh, first one was uh, Mario Gosselin's when I got when I got to Hartford. Um, they had it upstairs, and it was an old Vaughn, and I wore that up till 2008. So from '94 to 2008, I wore that, and then uh, Brian's made me one, duplicated it, um, obviously with better padding, and you know, uh, and then I wore that till the day I retired. So. I wore two, you know, that was it. And these guys were two a year at least, you know, (laughs) so, you know, but the, the evolution of the pants, you know, became a barrel and, you know, to me, that's the big thing right now is, is, is the pants and the chest protector and has nothing to do with the pads or the, because if you look back in the history, pads were 14, 15 inches wide back in even sixties. If you look at some of the, some of the, I know they were heavy as a wall or heavy as a house, but they were wide and you watch, you even look at Terry Sawchuk's blocker back in the day. The thing was massive. You know, the glove was nothing. You know, we, there's no way we could go to a glove like that because guys would break their hands and break their thumbs. And, you know, the, the it, this is the, I, that was 0405, same thing. It was a get rid of the cheater. It's called yes. the cheater. And they, they, I, I think it might've been Bauer built a sample. Yeah. And as soon as thumb. you remove that thumb protection, guys are like, yeah. we're going to break a thumb. Yeah. If you move the, the cheater was the best invention to save the hand, to save a thumb, but it was also meant there to be a cheater. But it was also there. It was a great invention that probably wasn't thought of that supports the thumb. So you take that away right now, it, the guys will snap their thumbs. They shoot the puck so hard, you know. And and, and you know, I hate to say it, the 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 stick elevate <laughs> is not going away. Like they're shooting the puck harder and harder. And now they got. I see Bauer has got a stick that has a hole in it and making it even lighter and more whip on the. Where does it come that we look at golf? Where golf is restricting there their drivers and then their irons and stuff like that. Cause eventually there's going to be a, a day that they come up with something that generates so much force and, and that these guys are getting smarter and smarter with technology. It's, it's, it's really gonna start hurting guys. Well, you, you know? like you said, the goalies are pretty protected now, but the one area that we've seen is, I mean, the mask it's, yeah, there, there's gotta be a threshold there and I credit the league for testing it now mm-hmm. and trying to come up with some numbers that guys mm-hmm. can see, but there's gotta be a, yeah, but they keep taking equipment away. That's is, is, is the issue to me, you yeah. know, let's make it small. Let's make like, that's, the GM's mentalities is they want to see four more goals and, and they want to make the goalie smaller. I, I get that, you know, stop drafting a guy who's six, seven, <laughs> you know, but I require a month then I can come out of retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever strap a month still? Most guys, when they're done, they're done. Nah, I'm, I'm like the odd time at, in practice here when, when guys are sick or something like that. And uh, I can't make it out for the extra guys. I'll go out and just to give them a laugh and joke around and, but uh, no, I don't. My knees are so bad that I don't. I don't go into much. Do you guys have a practice goal in Columbus? Like somebody yeah, that do. comes out to? Yep. Is that a trend you see? I mean, I remember talking to Doobie, Devin Dubnik, like the year he played thirty eight straight and many, and he's like, "Well, the only reason I could do it is because we had two other goalies, so I didn't have to practice." And I mean, I think we know as goalies and as a goalie coach, you know, a lot of practice is probably not great for your goalie. Yep. So no, we that we, idea is that you see that catching yeah, on. Yeah, our guy's awesome in uh, in Columbus and. Uh, he's drop of a hat. He's there and, uh, he's a goalie coach in town. So I think it gives him pretty flexible in, in the morning. So, but, uh, yeah, we, we, we call him up. He's there and, you know, give you played, a chance to work with your guys on specific things while he takes care of the guys walking of, through the slot. And, yeah. It's more of like doing the extra guy stuff. Yeah. Where we, we go out for goalie stuff in the, before practice, like half hour, usually before every practice. And he gets to take the, the injured guys and the extra guys shooting that, they're doing their half hour stuff. So it, it, it lets me work and not have to worry about them. Not that I worry about them anyway, but it's, uh, it gives them with someone to shoot on. So, okay. So go back to your career a little bit here. And after some time in the AHL mm-hmm. and a little bit in the eye, the, the old of, international hockey league, a lot of time in the minors. Mm-hmm. I, I want to ask you quickly, actually, before we get to the NHL debut with the Kings mm-hmm. year with the national team, what was mm-hmm. that like? Probably. It was just, it was funny. I just saw Corey Hirsch today and, uh, I saw him when he was in uh, Columbus last week and, you know, uh, he was the other goalie there and Alain Waugh, who ended up being my agent at the end. So, uh, you know, seeing Hershey, we just even talked today. I met his kid for the first time and 
we both agree that it was probably the most fun hockey that we both had that year because we were in a different country every year. Uh, we were sponsored by Black Label, so we had to, we had to go to all these restaurants and bars to sponsor the label. So, and the whole team had to be there, you know. And it was always packed with people. So, but it was uh, it was probably the most fun year. The only thing was that I regret now is we were in Paris, we were at the Louvre, we were in Germany, we were in all these great places. We were in uh, Italy, and I was too young and dumb to not take in the full culture of it all. It was just more about hockey and playing. Oh, it's a great country. Great. And we're in Paris. Walk around. It's pretty cool. Eiffel Tower. Great. You know, Louvre. Eh, I'm going to go have a coffee. I saw the Mona Lisa, but not appreciate everything else around the, you know, and, and see the culture and see the cultures in the cities where, you know, that's the only thing that kicks me to this day. But th- that was probably the, the best year. And then obviously uh, we won a silver medal. So it was pretty cool. <laughs> so Hershey mm-hmm. and the stamp mm-hmm. and all that. I was supposed to be in for the shootout. I was just going to say, I, th- yeah. I thought you were supposed to go in yeah, for that. So, so I, walk me through that story. So Hershey had issues with shootouts all year. And uh, now just for the record, I played in a charity thing with him. He, he's, he's a player now uh-huh. and he has trouble scoring in the shootout. <laughs> he tried the same move, Evan. He tried yes. the same move. And I told him it was I read probably it. like half the, sp- not even a quarter I, of the probably speed. Probably a quarter of the speed. <laughs> I told him I read it like a stamp. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's even better. You know, Hershey loved the man to death. Like we had a, we had a great tandem, and then Alain Wall was there too. So we had three of us. We we had a really good thing going, so it was great. And you know, we got him from the Rangers, and uh, he had to play. I think the seventy percent of the games he had to play, and which was fine. You know, I was coming out of a junior hockey, and I knew where I, my I situation was. And him and Tom Rennie had won a what they win a Memorial Cup uh, with Kamloops, Kamloops right? Yep. Um, I'm getting to play in the Olympics, and you know, one of my dreams as a child was to play in the Olympics, and you know, I'm lucky enough to be on this team and, you know, the World Juniors the year before, you know, got me on the team. So it was, uh, I was just happy being there, you know, and going into the tournament and the coaching staff came to me and said I was going to play in, if there was any shootouts, didn't care if it was the gold medal game or anything, it was, uh, I was going to go in. And I used to take, after practice, we used to be out there half hour with Korea and, and Nedved and uh, Contos and just shot, shot, breakaway after breakaway after breakaway. And we just sit there and do breakaways all after practice and gotten ready for it and comes to the final game and I get hurt, took a slap shot in warm up. You know, you do the three line shooting. Yeah. So ours went left, middle, right, back to middle. And then I took the shot from the right and the rebound went back out and I forget who it was, just followed in and I wasn't playing. So he shot his rebound and then tried to shoot his rebound in the empty net. And I took the shot in the middle. And I looked over and he had pulled it and it was coming straight at me. If I had stayed down, it would just hit me in the side and with the leg. But it scared me and shocked me. And I tried to move out of the way and it came right across and hit me in the left kneecap. And my knee just blew up. They thought I broke my kneecap. So I was... uh, Before the knee pads. Yes. And then uh, Alain Waugh had to dress for the... uh, They pull him out of the stands and dress him. And I was on crutches. Stood beside John Davison. Watching the final game on crutches. That, that, had, that had to be tough, especially knowing that shootout would have been yours yes, to watch. Yes, the funny whole thing was uh, Adrian Ercoin, who I played in the World Juniors with before. He's like, can you imagine if you have to go in and, in the in the gold medal game in a shootout? How how crazy would that be? And I'm like, don't even talk about that, you know? And then it ends up happening, you know? So, but uh, Hershey did well in the shootout. It gave us a chance to win. And, you know, Peter Nedved had it on his stick and it just rolled off and, you know, he had Sallow beat and just rolled off with his patent and move. And it just rolled off. And then uh, Forsberg comes down and does that in the extra shooters. And, you know, and then Korea, move. then Sallow stacks the pads on Korea. And, you know, it, it was over. Start your, start your pro career after the year after that. Mm-hmm. A few years in the minors. And then your first year with the your first year NHL. What do you yeah, remember? Seven years. Your debut with the six Kings? years, seven years in the minors. It was a long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like five. Five, five years. years we're doing math. It's nothing like, like this is, yeah. makes for good sound, me counting in my head. <laughs> five years in the minors. Mm-hmm. Debut with the Kings. What do you remember of that year and your first opportunity well, the, to play well, in the NHL? The whole time with Springfield being with the Whalers, I was probably up a full full season, just never got a chance to play. You know, uh, Jeff Reese was there when I first got there. And every time Burke, you went down, Sean Burke was right. the main goalie there. And, he would just stand on his head. He was, you know, awesome. And he was a great dude. And then uh, then I went to 
to Vegas for a year with contract issues with Hartford. And then I got traded to, to uh, LA and we were in Manitoba and I got called up from Manitoba and we just were at the end of our road trip and it was just like a weekend road trip up there. And so I basically had a suit and a track suit, you know, it was <laughs> nothing. And they were started a, a week road trip and, that, and, uh, so I was sitting in the, I beat them there a day before. Um, and, uh, I got a call in the, in the room, you know, I figured it was just the hotel calling up and it was a reporter asking me how I was going to like my first NHL debut. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Because both goalies got hurt last game. I go, what? I had no idea. <laughs> no Long idea. before the internet. Yeah, I said no idea. And social media. It was like, I had no idea because I didn't, you know, I was traveling all day. And sure enough, when I got into, they got into Florida, they're like, yeah, you're playing. I'm like, awesome. Great. <laughs> and it was against Sean Burke. So that was, you know, my childhood idol and my first roommate ever in uh, tra- first training camp. My first roommate was Sean Burke. In Hartford. And, in Hartford. Yeah. And he took me under his wing and bring me out to dinner and, you know, just did everything. Like, come on, you're coming with me every, every night. It was awesome. Such a great person. And uh, got a chance to, we ended up tying 1-1. So it was good. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Back in the days yes. of ties. It was <laughs> always be fitting. A uh, little bit with Long Beach Ice Dogs in the IHL and then Detroit. Mm-hmm. What? What was that like being part of those Red Wings well, teams? It was, it was funny being, uh, you know, my hung up on my agent when Detroit called because uh, I was a free agent that summer after LA and I ended up playing like 18 games, I think, with LA or 19 games, whatever yeah. it was. And July 1st came and my agent called me. It was 12.05, you know, when free agency started at noon and he's like, uh, Detroit wants to sign you. I'm like, why? like, we joke around all the time. So I hung up on him like, yeah, yeah, funny. That's funny. Five minutes after he called right back, goes, no, I'm serious. I'm like, come on. He goes, LA didn't want to sign me. He said, Detroit wants to sign me. He goes, yeah, Detroit wants to sign you. And that's, so I said, well, I call LA, see if they want to match. And we uh, went to Detroit. What were the, what, what, what's the lasting memory of that time in Detroit? Like there were so many big names and like, what do you, what do you take away from that and that experience? Just the, the room. Yeah. You're, you're, every time I walked in and see Steve Eiserman and Sergey Fedorov and Shanahan see, and Paul I remember and, walking into that as a reporter and being like, the, the, the forwards down one side, it was like one wing of the future Hall of Fame, and mm-hmm. the defenseman on the other side was yeah. like another future wing of the yeah. Hall of Fame. So, yeah. what's like as a, as a, you know, walking well, into I that just, as a free agent? I, well, first and my first roommate was Chris Osgood. You know, go up to Traverse City and, you know, I open the door and it's Ozzy. And I'm like, <laughs> great <laughs> you know and uh, ken reggett was there they just signed ken reggett so you know like he was a toronto maple leaf and i got to watch him a lot and uh you know then you go to there and you're seeing you know uh holly not holly wasn't there uh you know my first game or sergey was there on my team and you know the first exhibition game was against stevie and you know it we went out to the bar that first training camp night we went out to the bar and went out with Ozzy and uh, the whole team was there and I'm just sitting there going, man, I don't belong here. You know, <laughs> did, did, but did, do you have to overcome that feeling? Like, because goaltending is all about confidence, Manny. So like, yeah, it was, is it in the back of your head at all when you're playing there, when you see all these stars or do you know on the ice you fit in? No, it was, had nothing to do with about, about skill and stuff like that. It was expectations and you know, that walking in that dressing room was just, unlike any other dressing room I've ever been, it just, everybody knew their job, knew their situation, and everybody was holding everybody accountable. Stevie Eiserman wasn't allowed off the hook. Do you know what I mean? Not like he needed it, but I'm just, that's, that's the way that that team was. You know, Nick Lindstrom wasn't let off the hook. Like, you, you, you just couldn't float around. When you bring a man like Brett Hall in, who's got a strong personality and, you know, uh, no, was known around, and you bring him in and he fits in like a glove you know, and doesn't even blink and everyone's, I don't even see where everyone I was talking about, you know, he was an unbelievable teammate, unbelievable teammate. Um, so I, I just, that dressing room was just, you know, our fourth line won Stanley Cups, you know, with, with uh, Draper and Malpe and McCarty and with Joey Kosher the, before that. And, 
You know, that, that line won Stanley Cups for them because everybody, they did it all, you know, and they scored winning goals to win Stanley Cups. Do you get better in practice oh my by goodness. facing those guys? <laughs> yeah. like, do you embrace that, that yeah, opportunity, the, that well, challenge? The, the impressive thing with them is practice, they weren't long, but they were precise. Like every day was, this is what we're doing. They just didn't go out there and float around and expect it to win. It was everybody was dialed in for every practice. They were out there 15 minutes. It was dialed in for 15 minutes, but then it'd be off the ice. They weren't sticking out there for an hour and a half, fooling around after. It was, they'd come on the ice, boom, practice, get it done, you know, and then off, you're done, you know? And if you were felt a little slumpish, be the same guys like Shani would take shots after. And Stevie would always, you know, he called me fat butt, but it was a different name. And we'd go out a half hour, 45 minutes before every practice and we'd just shoot, you know? And that was every day, you know, with him. But that was the type of person he was, and that was my role, right? So, but practice time, and it was dialed in. Passes weren't made. It was an issue. Like, and they'd get on each other and be, and it was tick, tack, toe, shot. Everything was done precision, and that was the most impressive thing. Jimmy Bedard, what role did he play? Like, how Jimmy did Bedard your, your is, game evolve under him or, or well, he was during my goalie, that time? He was my goalie coach in, in Niagara Falls. And when I went to the World Juniors, he was instrumental in because i never played on big ice before and just him talking me through what's going to happen and how i had to change my game you know not be as aggressive being on the big ice and he was it was huge for me having him before i went to the world juniors and then he was that guy who you could talk to and he could get you out of a slump faster than anybody i've ever seen whole my whole entire life and that's how i design my the way i approach these guys He's the reason that I approach these guys and the way I, they think I'm crazy, but we all thought Jimmy was crazy, but there was a method to the madness and, and I owe him my whole NHL career. You know, I, I know it was him who got me to Detroit, you know, and it was going to be the third goalie and, you know, made Kenny Holland realize, and then it was my job to make the team. And, you know, I, I owe my whole NHL career to him, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I, I hope to be working with him one day again. You know, that, that's how much he means to me and, and, and meant to my whole career. Now, I mean, we could go through the rest of the career of mm-hmm. St. Louis and stops in Carolina, but I'm actually more fascinated in that, to be honest with you. And your transition into goalie coaching now with mm-hmm. the Columbus Blue Jackets and, you know, some of the other influences and how much of it, I guess, for starters, you talked about Jimmy Bedard and, mm-hmm. and um, you know, what he meant to you, how much of it was situational or how much of it was motivational but between the was, years versus was, between the pipes. Is that yeah, where well, you do most of your work now? Jimmy, well, especially at this level, they're all skilled and they're all highly trained getting to us. Um, obviously, there's a lot of technical stuff that we, we go through at this day and age that we didn't go through in mid-90s and, and uh, early 2000s. It just wasn't as technical as it is now. And and. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't realize how to coach different people and at different levels and different mentality levels and seeing him work with, with Dom and Cujo and then work with me and Ozzy and, and call-ups and stuff like that and how he approached different people and, and understood people and understood how they had to be coached and how they had to. And that taught me everything I, I do with these guys. And Obviously, the, the technical stuff is, is something I picked up over the time and seeing with other goalie coaches and, you know, understanding. And, you know, I was very lucky to be blessed with being a very athletic goalie. You know, I wasn't, uh, uh, you know, I had to. I was only 5'9". So, you know, my lateral movement, my skating was my, my assets and post-play and, you know, being able to get in and get out and, and doing different stuff and understanding it. Um, you know, I was, I was very lucky to bring that into my coaching. It's funny, that skating, that lateral movement, that ability to hold edges and be placed, like everything that's old is new again. No, yes, I mean, right. is that what we're seeing in the well, NHL I don't now? think it was, the old back then was, you know, stay square, stay, stay to the shot. And, you know, now it's, it's we've got a, well, especially in Detroit, all I had to do was make the first save and didn't have to worry about, you know. Some guy named Lidstrom, Lidstrom on the back door. Eh? Yeah. you know, <laughs> I just go down the list of guys, just take the rebounds and, and take everything away. And now you have to, with the, no holdups and, and the game's changed since mid-2000s where, you know, it, it's more, more net drives and more collisions and more 
crease play and more post play, it, it, you have to be able to make two and three saves at the drop of a hat, be able to go 10 different ways. So, you know, it, it's how you coach and how you develop these kids and how, how weight and, and distribution of, of your weight is, is so important. Balance and things mm-hmm. like that. Like, like you said, all elements that were important back then, just do you, do you think we lost that a little bit at any point? Did it become a little well, too, or is that just an outside perception? I just see that the way people coach at young levels, it's, it's so technical and they have them and nobody watches hockey anymore. You know, nobody watches hockey. It, it's all these kids watch the highlights that come to their phone, but no one watches the game and how, you know, these NHL guys are thinking and how they're approaching the game and, and how they're going over every aspect. You're just seeing them get scored on. You know, you're not learning how to become a goalie by watching. Oh, if I do that on this play, it works for him. I maybe I can take that into my game. And that's all we had when I was growing up. You know, I watched every single game and watched the goalies every single night looking at it and going, huh. So if he does that, he gets scored on it. But if you do this, and if I can do that, and if I can do this and add this to my game, they don't watch hockey anymore. They don't. They just watch highlights. That's why we started ProReads at ingomag.com <laughs> slash premium. <laughs> yeah. It's so just funny. We, like, did you guys watch the game last night? Oh, I saw the highlights. I'm like, <laughs> great. You saw the goalies get lit up. Great. <laughs> that's, why we like, that's why we like to highlight the saves on the, uh, on the ProReads. Um, Sorry, last one, because um, I, I know you got to go here. I've kept you away from the dinner table, but um, your guys right now, without like nothing specific about them, but like to work with young guys like mm-hmm. that, um, when the talent's clearly there, mm-hmm. what's the biggest challenge? Is it, is it like, how do you get, how, I'll put it this way, how do you help a goalie be confident at this level? Say an Elvis who has all this personality. And, and, and obviously he has confidence, but how do you help them feel confident at a new level and a new challenge on a new stage? Still learning. Like he's still, you know, he's, it's, it's been a long process of, you know, he's come with a lot of pedigree and he's played well in world championships and, and played well over in, in Switzerland and uh, has been a really good goalie over there, you know, but it's a totally different game and a totally different outlook and totally different way you have to play and, and, and approach the game and everything's in tight and more traffic. And, you know, it's been a long process and it's all on him. Like his, his, the way he's received it and been willing to change his game. Like he could easily just told me to beat it and I'm good. I'm, you know, I, I've proven I can play against any show guys in world champ. Yes, you have, but not on this ice and not at this, this level. And, you know, Sorry, you know, you haven't. And he's, you know, yeah, people say he's got an edge. and But when you, you're with and him. And I don't, when I say it, I, not in a negative way no, at all. But that's what some people are thinking. He's an unbelievable human being. Like, I've heard. you know, uh, he, he even asked to come and spend a couple of weeks with me and play golf right before the season. And, and we got to know each other. And, you know, we, we had a blast. And uh, the, the way he treats people and, the way he, man speaks five languages, like he's a very imp- impressive person, very impressive person. Um, you know, but the way he treated everybody at the golf courses and dinners and like, I'm like, this is a unbelievable, like I've heard, you hear stories when he gets, before he gets there, but he's just an unbelievable, unbelievable kid, you know, unbelievable kid. And Jonas Corpus Allos, his last two years have taken huge steps, humongous steps. Like if he doesn't get hurt, uh, he was rolling right before if, he got hurt. I know he gets goes to the All Star game. Not only to the All Star game. If he doesn't get hurt, I think he's up for Vesna this year. That's how well he was playing, and that's a credit to him because there was a lot of pressure. And Bob's gone, and it's your job now, and you have to be the starter, and you have to play sixty five games. And uh, it could have buckled him. You know, it could have buckled him. And uh, the way he approached everything mentally this summer and, and the way he's approached everything at the beginning of the year, it, it's, it's been, my hat's been off to him and, and he's taken every stride for it. And he deserved all the accolades coming up to, you know, and it was just a freak thing where, you know, a penalty shot that, you know, his, get tore his meniscus and it's unfortunate because I think he was having a Vesna, Vesna year. And, and again, it comes back to the talents there, mm-hmm. right? It's just a matter of how do you build that confidence, yeah. maintain that confidence in a season. And the mental aspect, it's, it's such a long season. And, 
you know, Elvis is seeing it now. He's like, it, it just, just doesn't stop. I go, he goes like Groundhog Day. I go, yeah. He said, it is. You know, we travel, we play, we travel, we play, we practice, we play, we goalie practice, we play. And you know, it's, it is. How much do you rely on video? Uh, it's non. It's videos every day. Yeah. If you're coaching now by video. So this is what all these kids watch. That's the only thing they understand unless they, it's, it's, it's a visual thing for them. They're, they're, they're people that just, you can tell them and you're like, Okay, if you do this, this, and you, you can just see it, uh, and they're thinking about it, uh, and then you show it, and you're like, oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. They, but you, you, everything's done by video, and everything has to be done, because you know, these kids are so visual these days with, with social media and everything that goes on. It, it's computers, the, uh, everything's visual. They're not thinking outside the box and where we had to visualize everything. In internal, okay, if I can rotate my foot this way and and get into the post better this way. I can get out faster this way. They have to see it. They have to visualize it and see it, you know? Perfect. Hey, Manny, we've taken, like I said, too much of your time. I know that that, that pregame meal is waiting upstairs. No, I think I missed it, but we, it's okay. <laughs> oh, they're still, they're still up there. They're still up there. Um, thank you so much for no, this. Uh, this has been awesome. We could have probably gone for another half hour, and yeah. I, I had so many questions, but I really appreciate it. I know our, our listeners are going to really enjoy oh, it. Thanks, thanks. It was Manny. fun. Appreciate it. Wow, you you guys covered some serious ground there, and uh, and there's some laughs uh, when he's talking about Stevie Y saying, "Come here, you you fat." <laughs> like, what do what do you say? You, you, okay, let, let, come along and hanging up on his agent when Detroit called Sean Burke being his first uh, his first uh, goalie partner or roomie. Uh, I mean that 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 was fun. Yeah, good, good dude, as you can tell. And the only downside was because we sort of scheduled it for before the game, like we probably like we really didn't get into there's a lot more to his career, right, that we didn't have time to touch on because I really wanted to I wanted to hit the Red Wing stuff. I wanted to hit the Olympics. Um, but I also wanted to talk about the transition and the mindset and the mentality that he brings to the goalie coaching um, position, especially with like, like, you know, we've known this for a while. We've talked about this for a while. But when Bob left and everyone kind of freaked out, like their depth chart is second to none when it comes to goaltending. Like it's not just Elvis and Corpy um, that are there right now. Uh, it, it, there's guys behind them and, and, and the guys that are in the minors right now that are doing a great job it doesn't even include Tarasov, Daniel Tarasov, the six foot seven Russian who some people compare to a young Pekarine, but with more structure in his game at this age. Like, uh, so fascinating to hear him talk about sort of his approach. Uh, and what it's what it's rooted in the difference between the work he does between the ears and getting them comfortable versus between the pipes and technical. Um, just yeah, really enjoyed the conversation. One of the all time good ones. And I guess the good news about getting cut off by that whole day job thing of having to watch the warm ups is there's room for a part two. And we'll we'll hold you to that. Uh, the chest protector and the wings going back to that when he broke in and then talking about uh, his upper body and basically you only use two of them. Uh, for his entire career, that that was staggering to me. Hutch, I mean, that going through through that era, you'd think you'd be want, wanting to update things as much as you could, but it was almost like that's what a lot of those guys did. Uh, Marty Brodeur stuck with the same old chesty for the longest time. Same thing. I remember Kevin getting a bit of a scoop on Marty's chesty way back when, when he got some photos in the locker room of his, I don't know how old it was at the time, Kevin, but his uh, entire career, he yeah, wore his entire career his up entire until career. last three, four years. Yeah. I loved listening to Manny talk about the chesty because I lived through that switch from chest and arm to the brown chesty. And what a, I think that's the biggest actual advance in goaltending equipment and protection and safety other than obviously a helmet. Uh, just a massive shift at the time. So it was fun thinking back to then and, uh, and what he did. And I just have to say, and, and I'll, I've said it many times before, and I'll say it again, as a vertically challenged goaltender, uh, I have no problem with him wearing 38-inch pads, and I wish we still did. I don't buy any of that stuff that they're only there for protection. If, if the pads were only for protection, then we'd all be wearing defenseman shin pads. Uh, they're obviously there for stopping pucks, and I think everybody should be allowed to use the same stu- tools to stop the puck. But I'll show Well, up Manny now. knew his uh, new stuff because he was going on about uh, the pads that were 14 inches. Uh, Terry Sawcheck's blocker, which was uh, a small pet door. Uh, uh, when, <laughs> when you looked at it, I mean, you, you could fit a black lab through, through uh, Terry Sawcheck's blocker if it was a pet door. 
Uh, so so he he had some information backing him up. I measured my old Coopers that are on the shelf here right after listening to that interview, and I've got a little over 13 inches at various parts of those those pads. So goaltenders were not completely smaller back in the day. Regulation now is 11 inches, so that's two two plus inches wider uh, back in the 80s. Well, and, and to me, though, the, you, you hit the nail on the head in terms of the biggest change being the chest protector. Manny talked about it. We've had a few other guys over the course of this podcast talk about it. The fear factor. Mm-hmm. The fact that it used to hurt a lot when you got hit in the body. And that's why you, <laughs> that's why you made reaching saves. That's why you sort of pulled away from that's why pucks you caught and the caught puck. them. Yeah, 100%. that's why you caught it with your hands because you didn't want to take it on the body. Now it's all about getting the most mass behind the puck. Because it doesn't hurt these guys. And interestingly enough, one of the lost arts is the ability to catch pucks in the pocket. And so we've seen glove makers have to reinforce the padding in the palms of these gloves. And, you know, guys like Manny will tell you, we didn't, we didn't worry about that. We just caught it right in the pocket because everything else hurt so much you didn't have a choice. Yeah, when you get it in the palm or the or the thumb, uh, shoulder bruises uh, were such a, a big thing. And yeah, uh, we we drone on about it, and people get uh, probably roll their eyes. But uh, yeah, it used to even pants. I mean, those those bruises on the inside of the thigh used to sting so much. And uh, Manny brought up the the barrel. Uh, I look forward to uh, to round two, and and not not only you know we get uh, tied into old school guys teaching new school techniques, but but Manny Manny's got a a real uh, stable of tall big goaltenders, and just curious whether that as a vertically challenged guy uh plays into uh his thinking and how he how he gets around that because they would play the position in a much strategically uh different way than than Manny would. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, interestingly enough is I mean that's what we always hear, right? When you can get the big guy to play like the little guy, you're uh that's when you're in great shape because the little guys have to perfect sort of the 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 patience and the tracking and the lateral speed to compete. And it's when you can get the big guys that, that work that hard on those types of details and closing space instead of opening up the holes in those big frames. That's when, that's when you've got a winner and they've got, you know, I mean, Merzlikens isn't small, right? Like he's not tiny by any stretch, but man, it was fun to watch him. It was his first game back here the other night and man, the speed and power and, sh- and, sh- and shout out to uh, Michael Lawrence, our friend, uh, goalie coach in the Swiss league uh, from Ottawa who played a big role in Elvis's development coming along and, uh, you know, a guy that I think Elvis leaned on even earlier this season when he wasn't getting an opportunity to play just to remind him to stay patient. And now that he's got the opportunity, I'm telling you, like, I know as we speak, they're both out of the playoffs, I believe. But I could see now that Elvis is back and Shesterkin with the Rangers, these two young guys absolutely leading their teams into the playoffs. The Rangers, who have been bad defensively all year, and Columbus, who's just banged up like unbelievably on the back end. I, I could see it. And then we hit unrestricted free agency this summer and there's all these experienced names and you're looking at all these kids having success and leading teams. It's like the shift is on guys. We're watching it in front of us, Carter Hart in Philadelphia. And it'll be interesting to see what kind of effect it has on free agency with older guys hitting the market this summer. Uh, no offense to you. It was a fabulous conversation with, uh, with Manny, but I would love to hear uh, a recorded conversation between Elvis and Manny. There's two personalities that could go on a couple of days. Well, I'm guessing that that would be fascinating. I will give you a snippet of a good conversation. In his first game back, one of his first saves, he went to move to the blocker side and it looked like he either missed an edge or hit a rut in the ice and he basically fell down and still made the save, but it looked awkward. Actually, it looked like it could have type of move that injures you. And, and I happened to be waiting to talk to Elvis post game. It was the last game we were allowed in the locker rooms before they were shut down by the league. And was just kind of waiting on the side. And Manny came up to talk to him. And, <laughs> and Elvis says, Sniper, Sniper, I'm pretty sure. I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty, he goes, I'm pretty sure it was Ian Clark, Clarky, his former goalie Come coach in Columbus, now with Vancouver. I'm pretty sure it was Clarky from the press box. He got me, Sniper. So there's probably a lot of comedy in those film sessions. Put a cone up there because ice is slippery, I've been told. Indeed it is. <laughs> uh, the gear segment this week, uh, we go to uh, the hockey shop. TheHockeyShop.com, source for Sports Surrey with Cam and uh, Woody. Uh, just a little preview before you get into it because it's a double interview relating to a, uh, a new product that's uh, taking hold in dressing rooms around hockey. Yeah, I know. And as we said at the top of the, top of the podcast, which is a while ago now, thanks to uh, Manny being so good, 
This is just a product that I stumbled on in a locker room. Uh, a guy that I play with, Doug Lynch, who, as you'll hear, had a pretty good career, uh, a couple games in the NHL, but internationally and junior as well, won a lot of titles, brought this product in. He's a part of the company and it kind of explained it to me. Uh, guys in the locker room tried the socks and it went from like, you know, in a locker room of 20, it went from one to two to four, you know, and now pretty much every guy in the room is wearing it. And so when we find things that work, this goes back, hey, Hutch, to like G-form knee pads noticing that Tim Thomas and, and, and Carey Price used them under their knee pads like a decade, more than a decade ago, writing about it, and then having companies actually go out and purchase the rights to use that type of foam in their goaltending equipment. If we find something that we think is worth talking about because it works, we're going to do it here on the podcast and at ingoldmag.com. And I think this Zenkai product one is one that fits that bill for sure. Starting with the socks, there's other material, uh, undergarments and stuff that I'd recommend, but socks for sure. One caveat before we head into it, guys, there's no, they're not skate proof or skate cut proof. Um, they're not cut proof socks. They're not a high sock. They basically just come above the skate. So if you're going to go this way, you are going to need to make sure you have a cut proof undergarment sort of legging um, over top of them. We'd, we'd recommend, obviously, uh, we, we did the one and now I'm going to butcher another name, but uh, uh, Honorick. Um, with uh, the the leggings and the padded leggings, and then yep. the the bottom with the skate proof, you're definitely going to need that. And I would recommend it. We've had a couple scary incidents and near calls lately. Um, but in terms of in your skates, uh, well, listen to the interview. There's just a ton of good stuff here. Let's uh, step into it. It's Zenkai on the In Goal Radio podcast, brought to you by the Hockey Shop, thehockeyshop.com, source for sports. Here is the gear segment led by Woody. Welcome back to the Hockey Shop Source for Sports, thehockeyshop.com. If you can't make it here in person, you can find them online. We're down here in what I call goalie heaven, surrounded by the latest, the greatest in goaltending gear. But we're going to actually take this upstairs, so to speak, um, to a different section of the store for accessories and actually apparel and a new sort of undergarment provider that I've gotten hooked up with personally through some connections that the hockey shop and the hockey shop.com is ahead of the curve on stocking. Um, not everyone has this in yet. The company's name is Zenkai. Uh, and the, their product basically doesn't get wet. And we'll explain that in a little bit. We're going to talk about the socks today um, because they're unique. They're a compression sock with a built-in... Um, lace bite protector. And like we'll walk through the tech and specs on this in a minute. But I play in a skate, an alumni skate, a junior A alumni skate on, on, on every week. And they gave me a sample set of these to try and a couple guys around the room, a sample set to try. And now pretty much everyone in the room has bought them. They're that good. Um, when you finish your skate and get out of your s- skates, they're almost dry. There's no bunching. There's no gathering. And I don't have problems with lace bite. I'm, I'm lucky I have a custom fit, you know, 3D molded uh, set of CCM uh, goalie skates. So lace bite's never been an issue for me. Uh, but other guys that do swear by these for that. So when do you guys start stalking? What can you fill us in on, Cam, on some of the details of not just the Zenkai uh, product line and, and why it works, but specifically these socks and the experience you guys have had selling them? So yeah, we've had our most success with the socks in particular. Like we have carried uh, bits and pieces of the other line. Um, to be honest, I'm not 100 percent up to speed on how they're doing because yes, it is a total floor above mine. So and to hang out in the basement. So a when bit we too say much. that this one is above your head, it's literally above your head it's, on another it, floor. It's not even a figurative of speech. It's actually above my head. Okay, and just for for those who don't know, this little slice of goalie heaven that we we call the goalie department at the hockey shop. Source for Sports in Surrey is actually in the basement. They have their own floor. So literally, these are in the apparel section upstairs, and they are above Cam's head. Uh, in terms of how they work, though, how far above your head are they? Uh, a little bit, to be honest. And uh, here's a product that you actually kind of more so brought to me for once other than the other way around. Not the first time. <laughs> Easy. Now, you know, uh, I know we've had them in the past, and I know they've been uh, upstairs. It's just not something I've looked into too much, but now all the things that you are describing are starting to apply to me a little bit. I have a little bit of lace bite every now and then. Um, I hate wet 
bunchy socks. There's nothing worse than coming out of your and your socks are all gathered and bunched and just gross. So what we should flip this around is, hey, Kevin, uh, working for the hockey shop, what can you tell me about these Zenkai socks? You know what? I can tell you that they work. I'm going to be honest, though. I haven't quite figured out why or how. So with that in mind, let's call up and turn this over to Doug Lynch, who's, who's one of the guys behind this product. There's some roots here. This is a product that that was originally sought after by Nike in terms of the way this material doesn't get wet and rather than wicking away moisture, the way it actually functions. Again, I don't know the ins and outs. We're going to let Doug explain it to us now. What I can tell you is that when you get out of those skates, all that bunching, all that soaked gross socks that feel miserable and, and quite often can lead to, you know, whether it's blisters or rubbing in bad spots because the socks have bunched or gathered, there's none of that with these socks. And like I said, from two or three guys trying it in the locker room at a skate that includes a two-time Stanley Cup winner in Bob Rouse, uh, and a lot of guys who played at high levels, junior, overseas, uh, NCAA, junior A, in that locker room full of those guys, everyone is now buying these socks because they work so well. So let's head over to Doug and have him explain it to us now. Sounds good. Okay, so we just finished talking at the hockey shop with Cam about Zenkai and uh, in particular about the socks. But now we've got Doug Lynch, uh, one of the founders of Zenkai and a longtime professional hockey player. Lights me up now uh, at a couple of skates a week out here in the South Surrey area. I feel better, actually, Doug, about getting lit up by you now that I've checked out the Hockey (laughs) DB. It doesn't feel so bad losing to you on a weekly basis when I know that you've won, what, seven championships, a couple overtime winners in there? Played at every level, starting in the WHL right up to the NHL with the Edmonton Oilers. I'm feeling okay about all those goals you're scoring on me now. <laughs> well, I, I don't think you're giving yourself enough credit, Kev, because every time I see you, you're decked, you're decked out head to toe in new equipment. Yeah, th- so I look good. Don't necessarily play good, but I look good. You, you, <laughs> you look good, but man, I, if I had to use a new stick or a new pair of gloves every day, I... God, I'd be so frustrated out there. So I think you do an amazing job, all things considered. All things considered is the key there, Doug. Listen, uh, I got to say, I'm moving better, feeling better with my Zen K socks and, or Zen Kai socks, pardon me. It's amazing to me. We, were, we talked with Cam about, like, there's no bunching in there. Um, the guys in the room have all bought in, uh, all the guys that skate. And as, as we've said, there's a lot of, there's guys that, you know, right up to two-time Stanley Cup champions in that locker room. They're all buying into this product. Um, I don't have lace bite issues myself, but the guys that do just swear by it. Uh, can you walk me through, you know, maybe some of the, me and Cam talked at the shop about the basics, but walk me through sort of some of the technology, some of the concepts here. Cause for years, you know, we've, we've heard about materials that are designed to wick moisture away and this isn't the case here. And there's some science that says there's a reason this is better. Yeah, well, it's been a really interesting um, journey for us, Kevin. It's been two and a half years with us at Venkai in development of this product and this technology. And what, what we were finding was all the science now of Europe was starting to ask the questions of why athletes sweat. And evolution tells us that we sweat as human beings to cool ourselves down. And so when our body starts overheating, we perspire. That's what sweat is. Well, when you pull or wick the moisture off of your skin into a garment, your body's not getting the proper cooling effects because it's not do- be evaporating naturally. So your body actually says, wait a second, I'm not getting cool. I must have to work harder to produce more sweat. So you actually get into this vicious cycle of your body constantly overheating to try to cool itself down when, when we're performing at a high level in athletics. So how does the Zenkai product, and obviously the socks are what we talked about, but, the, but there's also undergarments um, designed for hockey as well. Like how does, how does it perform differently? Why is this thing always so dry um, compared to other undershirts I've worn where you finish and it's just like it's matted to you? Yeah. So we have a proprietary technology in our company called Filium. Uh, Filium repels liquid. It repels water, re- repels whatever, uh, wine, beer, the Gatorade, whatever it is. And so what ends up happening is that when we're wearing our apparel, Zenkai, you, you, it allows a thin layer of sweat to stay on your skin. That sweat is then allowed to evaporate naturally through our, through our cotton material, through our shirts and through our, our, our pants. And that keeps us cool. That chemical reaction of water turning to vapors will keep us cool. So because our shirts repel water, repel the sweat, it keeps it on our body where it's designed to be. 
And as an athlete, as we're playing, you stay cooler during competition. You don't overheat. So it's been an incredible journey for us uh, developing this product, testing it, and watching athletes like yourself wear it, going, this is crazy. Like, I'm staying cooler on the ice. The product's working. I'm not overheating. And at the end of the game, my shirt's basically dry is because everything's being repelled off it and evaporating naturally into the environment. And the other part is it kind of... It doesn't stink. It doesn't seem to build up any stink the way other undergarments do in terms of wash cycles and how often you need to. How does that work? Well, and that's another interesting... Yeah, no, Kevin, I'm glad you brought it up because it's one of the things that I was most interested about during this process. But as humans, once again, our sweat is naturally odorless. It's the bacteria in the sweat. When that gets trapped into the fibers of our clothes and dries, that's what stinks. So because our apparel repels moisture, repels liquid, repels water or sweat, whatever it happens to be, there's no bacteria being trapped in the garment. So once you take our shirt off, you shake it, all the water just just flings right off of it, you hang it up, it dries 40% quicker than anything on the market, and there's no bacteria in it. So you can wear the same compression bottom, socks, workout shirts, hoodie, whatever it is, 5, 10, 15, 20 times and not wash it, which is insane. Like if, if I wasn't involved with this last two and a half years, I wouldn't even believe it. Well, I was going to ask you, but, like that's... Oh no, I was going to say, uh, I, I, I take detailed records of um, when I wear the stuff that I wear because I want to make sure that I can talk about it. And I've currently, the base layer set that you watch me play in every week, I've actually worn it 16 times, almost two and a half months worth of men's league hockey, and I haven't washed it yet, and nobody can sell anything on it. I was going to say, we haven't kicked you out of the room yet. That's a pretty good sign that it's working. <laughs> yeah, or my, or my fiance hasn't kicked me out of the house yet. Can you imagine coming home with, with hockey equipment? You haven't washed your base player in two and a half months. <laughs> so and she's still with me. So I'm doing something. Uh, I was right. going to say, that's a quick recipe not to turn the fiance into the wife if you do that. Um, the uh, <laughs> right. I, I got to ask you, because cause when you, we, we've been sort of, um, brain rust isn't the word, but we've just sort of learned that, you know, wicking and wicking and getting the water off your body. We've learned that, that, you know, that's what we've been sort of inundated with. That's the right way. Um, was there any skepticism on your part when you first heard this? Have you seen skepticism elsewhere? And then when guys experience it, is it kind of everything like what we've seen in the locker room in terms of like, I just can't believe the socks. It, what a difference it makes to just sort of take the skates off and, and, and have them still be dry and not bunched up and things like that. And, you know, trying the undergarments and workouts, same type of sensation. Is that the feedback you're getting from everyone that tries it? Yes. And first of all, Kevin, huge skepticism. When I fell into this and started talking to my partner about this and developing this, I am our number one worst enemy as a company. I'm the guy that wears this, uh, wears this thing to the death and I'm pushing it to the boundaries every week, every day. I'm running and pouring rain. I'm I'm taking this and doing hot yoga in it and it's 900 degrees in these yoga studios. I'm doing everything to, to test the limits of our product. And I didn't believe it. And it's been two and a half years and I can't believe the response. Every player, every person we put it on, they're like, Doug, we didn't think that this was going to work, but it's doing everything you said it was going to do. So it's been a really nice validation. We're a startup. Uh, I put blood, sweat, and tears into this for two and a half years, plus a lot of the money I made playing playing hockey. So for me, it's, I'm all in on this. And I can't believe the feedback. It's been so positive. Mind you, anytime you're going out there trying to take on uh, a paradigm shift or you're trying to change a culture or the way you're thinking, of course there's opposition. And when, it, when I'm pitching this to sports teams and universities and athletic clubs, there's huge skepticism as soon as they start wearing it. As soon as they start wearing it and experiencing it, it's, we've seen orders now, customers coming back five, six, seven times in just the first three, three months here now of us starting, uh, ordering more and more product. Well, I can tell you from the locker room, as you know, the feedback's been nothing but positive. And you know, we've gone from one set to two sets to pretty much the whole room in those black socks with the green trim. Of course, part of that green is the lace bite protection, which has been big for other guys. Um, folks, you can check them out at zenkaisports.com online. Uh, that's Z E N K A I sports.com or at the hockey shop.com hockey shop source for sports as part of our gear segment here. Uh, we talked about the socks, there's undergarments, 
Uh, there's workout wear. There's stuff you can wear on the ice. Uh, there's even sort of casual wear for travel and, and training. Pretty much everything you need. Doug, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Look forward to trying more of the products in the near future. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Okay, so there's the explanation. Now, here's how you get it. Um, the Hockey Shop Source for Sports in person in Surrey or thehockeyshop.com. You can search it by Zen, Zenkai, Z-E-N-K-A-I. We'll be sure to put some links up uh, on social media. Uh, you can't miss them. They're a black sock with sort of bright green, like think Seahawks neon green accents, including in the lace bite section. Uh, we'll get some of this up on social media so that with some links so that you can find it yourself. Uh, and as Doug talked about, there are some other products here. We haven't had a chance to, to wear a lot of them yet. Um, you know, it's not, there's not padded shirts yet, like some of the things we've seen other manufacturers come up with for goaltending. But in terms of an underlayer, um, whether it's for playing or for just working out, there's some really promising things here. And, and you guys stock that as well. So check them out. The Hockey Shop Source for Sports or thehockeyshop.com. That's Zenkai, Z-E-N-K-A-I. Cam, thanks for sort of helping on this one. That was all you. I, I'm just here. Give me a call. You're the pretty face. Until next week from the Hockey Shop Source for Sports, thehockeyshop.com. I'm Kevin. He's Cam. I don't know what else to say. It, it's amazing. We, we've heard about uh, the technology and we've used the technology and it continues to get better. And, and now, now you can play, you can sweat and you don't get wet at all. Well, it's that, pretty wild. Well, that's the thing, though. Like it actually the idea is it leaves a little thin layer of sweat on you, which I mean, again, yeah. like and he admits it. Doug admits it in the interview. It sounds like, come on, really? Come on, really? But yeah. then you start to you check their website. You look at the science. And, you know, it kind of makes a lot of, it does make some sense. But then when you experience how dry that sock or that undergarment is underneath um, and the way it, like, it's just moisture resistant. And, you know, I don't have the science. I didn't, you know, all I can tell you is my, my, everything felt great in the skate. Um, it's not like I was sitting there going, I can't tell you that I was less fatigued because I maintained a layer of sweat and didn't sweat more. Um, but in terms of my feet, they felt fantastic. And I don't have lace bite, but guys that do in the locker room swear by this stuff. And for me, it, I was editing that uh, interview last night, and I'm a sucker for tech. I'm a sucker for uh, science. I have a graduate degree in exercise physiology. They all came together, and uh, I texted Cam right away, and I said, put two pair aside. I'm coming in on the weekend. So uh, fascinated to check them out and see if we can understand what's going on there a little bit more. Um, definitely worth trying. You know, nobody buys more product through the gear segment than we than do. Hutch. <laughs> uh, you, <laughs> like, uh, you, I, I know I, I love perusing I the hockey shop website every I week. Do, I was just on there, boys. I, 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 and that is a true story. But uh, but yeah, you uh, the last couple of weeks you've been you've been all over it. So good on you for uh, for putting your uh, your money where your mouth is and your ears are. Well, I feel uh, like a bit of a celebrity. If you know Kevin drops names because he's in the locker room all the time. But hey, I can text Cam at eleven o'clock at night and say put aside a pair of socks for me. When does he get back to you? Um, he did last night actually. Nice. Yeah, he did. He did right away. He's a newlywed. He'll learn quickly. Yeah. <laughs> These, uh, you, you talk about the cut proof too. Uh, there's sleeves that you can get uh, to go up over over top. So, well, we're using the uh, the the new product from Daredevil as well, which includes the yeah. cut proof around the Achilles, but also above the knee and uh, and in the femoral artery area, and it's just been fantastic. So, another option. There's lots of options. Sounds like a review needs to be done. Uh, I think there will. Mm -hmm. I think there will. We've been talking. Let's do it, and uh, and then I can text Cam at uh, at eleven thirty, and uh, and tell him to to put a set to set aside for me. Uh, <laughs> Tommy Sallow uh, came up in this uh, episode because he was the winning goaltender against Team Canada and uh, Corey Hirsch in that Olympic gold medal final, and Doug Lynch scored the game winning overtime goal in the Memorial Cup in two thousand one as Red Deer uh, beat Valdor in the Memorial Cup in the, in the Queen City. And Max Daniel was the goaltender in that one. Max had a great start to his junior career, never uh, carried over. But, uh, but he was, I mean, there was a time there where he was going to be the, the top guy. So uh, there's, uh, there's just a little bit of history as we tie two things together. 
Thank you very much uh, to uh, Manny Legacy for Doug Lynch and for Cam, of course, at the Hockey Shop, Source for Sports Surrey, thehockeyshop.com, and to Woody and Hutch as well. Thanks to you for listening, and uh, we'll wick everything away, and we'll get back to you next week for a brand new episode of In Goal Radio, the podcast presented by Source Sports Surrey, the hockey shop, thehockeyshop.com. Hockey